Is it on? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started um, right now. I want to thank you all for uh, attending. And the uh, first item, or the first thing that we're going to do is uh, we're going to have an opening prayer. So I'd ask that all of you stand, please, for our opening prayer. And Eldon Grafton Anto will be doing the prayer for us. <coughs> There are uh, many ways to begin. The Aboriginal thing that we do is we offer our prayers. And um, one of the other things that we do is we do a, we do a smudge, we light a smudge. Uh, so today I, I'm going to light the sage. And I'm just going to let it um, give off the smoke. And. Um, If anybody would like to smudge, well, um, maybe uh, you could take a smudge around for people um, while I do the prayer. Creator, as we gather in this beautiful place, we are called together <clears throat> because our students, our young ones, are now prepared to go in and uh, uh, <clears throat> work for society and uh, interpret and have the law to work. And so as we uh, gather in this place of law where we ask Creator to come here and continuously to be here and His Spirit leads us. His Spirit leads us along and so we give thanksgiving for that. I give thanksgiving for Mother Earth and all that she has uh, provided for us here. She gives us all our foods she gives us the water that we drink and survive on. We give thanks for that. She gives us the trees that grow all over. And through that, through that, the, um, through those the trees changing the air and fixing it up right for us so we can breathe, we become, we are relatives, we as, junior relatives to our and to our rel relations the trees and and on on the earth is the medicines that mother earth provides for us and we have one of the medicines going around now sage uh, we use sage to uh, to cleanse our spirit our energy and uh, because because of the way we understand Creator being in our midst, this is a, a visible way of celebrating the presence of Creator through the smudge. We also use the sweet grass, which is another medicine, and uh, it's, it does another beautiful thing. And uh, we, we also have the uh, cedar, which is used to cleanse and to heal. And um, we also use the tobacco as the uh, go between between we people of the earth and creator in the sky world so we're thankful for all those and then we give thanksgiving for the um, uh, animals that creator has placed here to, to to cultivate the earth we give thanksgiving for the birds that creator has placed in our in the trees so that we can hear them and they provide us music and beautiful colors and even even food so we're thankful that all these things are true then we give thanksgiving for uh, the wind the wind that 
changes things. The wind changes everything. And so as we, as we move along, we, as we move along in these instances, the wind is our, our helper. Then we give thanksgiving for the thunderers who come from the west. They bring renewal as they come across the country and go around the world. They, they, they bring renewal through their thundering and through their lightning and through fire and through uh, the noise, the sound. They keep the monsters underground because when they, keep, when they do that, the monsters stay away. And so, so we're thankful that this still, this still uh, we do our ceremonies to keep these things going. Then we give thanksgiving for our elder brother, the sun, who rises daily every morning in the east and he works his way across through the sky and uh, sets in the west every evening. And we look forward to his return every, every day. We give thanksgiving in the evening for our grandmother, the moon. The moon, our grandmother provides us with, as she, she governs the, uh, our, our world. And uh, uh, I guess the best metaphor I can use on it is that she, uh, she determines the time when children shall be born. And anybody with that kind of power, we need to pay respect to Grandmother Moon. And then we give thanksgiving to the uh, four directions, the four directions that in north, east, south, and west, where the Creator has placed helpers there for us. And so we often need to remember them and ask for their, their leadership and guidance. And then we give thanksgiving for the stars that beautify the night sky. Stars are our, are our ancestors because when Creator first came here to this place, darkness, he, he thought, what, what, what should it be like? And as his thoughts went out into the darkness, they lit up the sky. And so we still see that happening today because, because it's new, as we understand now, there's new, there's new creations happening all over. So, so we're thankful for that. That's still happening. And then we thank Creator for all those people who, who have, who have understanding. Creator gave us laws. And whenever our people were falling and falling and the Aboriginal people were falling into the ways of uh, death, dying through their inattention, and uh, Creator often sends a prophet among us and he reminds us of the way that we should go, how to behave, how to care for one another, how to, and uh, in this day and age, he tells us, he's telling us to, to go back and learn our medicines and learn our language and learn our things. And so these are the ways that we will be able to continue on here. And these, this great law that was gave, given to the First Nations people through symbolized through some of these symbol symbols that I'm wearing it everything is so symbolic and uh, I don't have all that much time to tell you everything but there is a beautiful story in all these little little designs that 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 are shown on our clothes and uh, that's why that's why when you're out there when you go to work you too will be dressed in a symbolic way to emphasize, to show what you're about. And so we as Aboriginal people need to know the, the good things that the Creator has given to us and help <coughs> our brothers and our sisters and our relations to live here in a good way. So for this I give thanks. And um, <clears throat> in, in closing I just say, Yawako, miigwech, and there be, let there be a blessing upon this place. Yama. Miigwech. Uh, thank you, Grafton, for uh, opening the uh, event this evening. I appreciate your attendance and your good words. The uh, chief of Mississaugas of New Credit First Nation, Chief Brian Maform, was unable to be here this evening. 
Uh, but he sends his greetings from his community, and there was an emergency that happened in the community and that prevented him from coming. But he sent his words ahead of him, and I have his, uh, his notes for his uh, remarks and his welcome to you, so I'll read those uh, to you now. Uh, he also wanted to acknowledge and thank Grafton for uh, being here today and for his opening prayer. Um, he says that your presence at this meeting is important, and this is especially true when we gather to talk about our First Nations. We need your guidance and support. He also wanted to welcome all of you here today to the original territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit First Nation. The people of Mississaugas of New Credit since time immemorial have called these lands home, these lands along Lake Ontario. Today there are many First Nations here as there are many First Nations across Canada whose strength and purpose binds us together as allies. You are all here today to discuss 20 years of Bill C-31 amendment to the Indian Act. On June 28, 1985, Bill C-31 attained royal assent. Bill C-31 is the legislation that allowed the reinstatement of Indian people who lost their status in band membership through restrictions in the Indian Act, such as marriage, joining the army, and enfranchisement. Bill C-31 and his amendment to the Indian Act that rescinds the old provisions of band membership and allowed for the reinstatement of those who met the criteria. The Act was intended to help First Nations women and protect their status and that of their children. However, there is a negative impact on our people because of Bill C-31. The rapid increase in band membership brought about by Bill C-31 has stretched our resources to their limit. People added to the band list under Bill C-31 are adult individuals who required adult resources such as land, housing and education and social services. Bill C-31 has brought both a positive and a negative to the First Nations. We as First Nation people have had changes imposed on us for more than a century. It has not always been the change we want, but it is the testament to our strength and resilience that we are still here. We will remain steadfast and strong in asserting our right to govern ourselves and to live our lives. Miigwech. I can't uh, ask all those claps along to uh, Chief Laforme, but uh, I'll let him know that you appreciated his uh, his uh, welcome. I want to as well thank all of you for being here for today's program. My name is Tracy O'Donnell. I'm Nishnabekwa from uh, Northern Ontario. I'm a member of Lake Helen uh, Reserve, which is just outside of Thunder Bay. Uh, I've been practicing law in Ontario for over 10 years, maybe 11 or 12. I can't uh, do the math properly. Uh, I was elected as a bencher recently, and uh, as a bencher of the Law Society, I'm here chairing this panel today. Today's event is to celebrate National Aboriginal Day. The event is sponsored by the Law Society together with a number of community partners, and I wish to acknowledge those community partners that uh, helped to make this event happen. We have the Toronto Aboriginal City Celebration Committee, the Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto, Lodia Dates Aboriginal Advisory Group, the Ontario Justice Education Network, the Aboriginal Law Section of the Ontario Bar Association, and the Association for Native Development in the Performing and Visual Arts. Together, these partners brought this event to you. This event is one in a series of public forums that the Law Society hosts throughout the year to encourage an exchange of information, ideas, and action on legal issues relating to the rights and needs of Aboriginal peoples and other equality-seeking groups. Today's topic is about the ongoing effects of Bill C-31. These amendments to the Indian Act were made 20 years ago. As um, Chief Laforme had remarked in his notes that it was on June 28, 1985 that these amend uh, amendments received royal assent. They were intended and the purpose of the amendments were to address a historic discrimination that existed in the Indian Act, a discrimination that played itself out against the women of the First Nation communities. Prior to the Bill C-31 changes, 
status Indians could lose their status through a process called enfranchisement. Indian women who married non-Indian men lost their Indian status. They were no longer entitled to the benefits and the rights that came along with that Indian status. Indian men, however, who married non-Indian women were allowed to pass that status on to those non-Indian women, so they became Indians under the Indian Act. Status Indians who earned university degrees, became lawyers, became doctors, also lost their Indian status. Status Indians who wanted to join trade unions, join the army and fight for Canada in the World Wars, they lost their Indian status. Many events over many years ultimately led to the passage of Bill C-31. Specifically in 1974, there was a Supreme Court of Canada case, Laval and the Lovelace case, uh, and this was brought before the United Nations in 1981, as well as extensive advocacy from Aboriginal women's groups in Canada, particularly the Native Women's Association of Canada, and the entrenchment of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. All of these taken together resulted in this change to the Indian Act, Bill C-31. The amendment created two classifications for registration of status Indians. You had Indians who are registered under 6-1 of the Indian Act, and Indians who are registered under 6-2 of the Indian Act. The main difference between these two sections is that if you're a status Indian with 6-1 status, you're allowed to pass your Indian status on to your children. If you're a status Indian who's <coughs> registered under 6-2 of the Indian Act, you're not allowed to pass that status on. This was the very first time in our history that the Indian Act <coughs> imposed a generational cutoff in passing status on. Even prior to uh, C-31, the Indian Act allowed Indian men to pass status on to their children and their children could pass it on to their children and so on. But Bill C-31, in attempting to correct a discrimination that existed, primarily in taking status away from Indian women who married non-Indian men, introduced a generational cutoff, and that's what six, category 6-2 is all about, that didn't exist prior to C-31. The C-31 amendments also dealt with band membership rules, and that's a very continu uh, continuing to be a very contentious issue for First Nations peoples and their community. Today we have a panel of experts here who are going to talk about the effects of Bill C-31 amendments. We're going to allow each speaker to have a allotted period of time to address you on these uh, issues and I'm going to introduce you to them. We're going to allow you to ask questions at the end of the panel presentation. So, you know, remember your questions if you have questions because there will be time to ask the questions of the speakers here today. So I'm, I'm going to sit down. I'm kind of short, and I think you could only see my head <laughs> from where you're at. There's more to me than just the head. So <laughs> I'm going to move over here and uh, join my colleagues at the table. I'm going to introduce uh, all of the speakers and then allow them to speak in turn. To my immediate left, and you can see all the name tags so you'll know uh, who I'm speaking about, is Mary Eberts. Mary received her BA and her LLB from the University of Western Ontario and her LLM from the Harvard Law School. She was called to the bar in Ontario in 1974. Her litigation practice focuses on equality rights and includes trial and appellate work. Mary was a co-founder of the Women's Legal Education and Action Committee and the first chair of its National Legal Committee. She has acted for the Native Women's Association of Canada since 1991 on a number of charter cases. She has participated in two national consultations on Bill C-31, organized by the Native Women's Association of Canada and the National Roundtable on Bill C-31. Court challenges in December of 2001. Mary was elected a bencher of the Law Society of Upper Canada from 1995 to 1999. She received the Law Society Medal and the Governor General's Gold Medal for her work on equality. Most recently, she was appointed to hold the Henderson Chair in Human Rights at the Faculty of Law, University of Ottawa in the academic year 2004-2005. 
You have in your program folder a comprehensive suggested reading list on today's topic that was submitted by Mary. And I believe the folders are available if you came in through another door uh, at the entrance at this end of the room. Sitting beside Mary is Lynn Gell. Lynn is a member of the Algonquin Turtle Clan. She's a first year <coughs> PhD Native Studies student at Trent University. Using her first person experience, Lynn speaks out and writes on many topics as they pertain to Indigenous peoples. This includes the continued discrimination in the Indian Act, the politics of subjectivity and identity, and the intersection of the gendering of native identity and the contemporary treaty process in Canada. Lynn has been the recipient of the Ontario Graduate Scholarship as well as the very prestigious social services, our social sciences and humanities research council doctoral fellowship award. You have in your program folders a chapter from Lynn's master's thesis. It's entitled literature review by thematic breakdown continued the Indian Act blood quantum and phenotype physiology. Sitting beside Lynn is Alan Manick. She's a status entitlement worker with Aboriginal legal services of Toronto. Ellen is an Ojibwe from Beausoleil First Nation in Ontario. She has more than 20 years experience in the legal profession as a legal assistant working in various law firms. Currently she assists members of the community in their applications and dealings with the federal government and First Nations communities over status. Ellen will be bringing to you her, her perspective on the effects of Bill C-31 on Aboriginal people in the urban environment. And then um, on the far side is Wayne Beaver. Wayne is a member and elder from the Alderville First Nation. He also serves as a band counselor. He has been an active voice for his community in expressing concerns over the effects of the Bill C-31 amendments to the Indian Act for a number of years. In fact, when the amendments were first announced, Wayne started uh, protesting these and trying to call attention to effects of these amendments on the communities. Alderville First Nation was one of several communities that commissioned a report to study the short, medium, and long-term effects on First Nation population trends as a result of Bill C-31. His contribution to the panel discussion will be to provide the First Nation community perspective. These are the panelists, and Mary, if you'd like to begin the discussions. <coughs> Thank you very much, and uh, I would like to thank uh, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation for not only welcoming us here today, but for allowing most of us to live on their territory, which is no small welcome. Um, I always uh, like to say this at the beginning of um, speeches of this nature that I make. I must. I feel I should identify myself. Um, my background is uh, of French and Scottish settlers uh, to the Detroit frontier uh, before 1800. And so as I have uh, looked into my own family background and my own family's experience here, I have become very interested in uh, issues of what uh, settlers and ultimately Canadian governments uh, have done to the First Peoples who welcomed us here. And uh, so what I will be uh, speaking about today as part of the presentation on the continuing effects of Bill C-31, which is only 20 years old, is uh, some of the effects of the predecessors to Bill C-31 which um, failed to be removed by Bill C-31. And the dynamic of Bill C-31 itself, which not only failed to remove uh, linger very large old problems, but created new problem dynamics for First Peoples to deal with. So my overview of the history uh, starts before Confederation with uh, an act that was um, passed in uh, the 1800s and 1850s. Um, the uh, focus in many historical accounts is usually on the provisions of this pre 
Confederation legislation which deal with what happens to Aboriginal women who marry non-Aboriginals. Because it was before Confederation in the 1850s when the Canadian state, the British Crown, first introduced the concept and the rule that Aboriginal women who marry non-Aboriginal uh, men would lose their status, lose their entitlement to benefits that the British Crown was prepared to extend to Aboriginal people in return for taking virtually all their land. And uh, what I would like to do is just broaden the lens a bit because uh, the legacy of that legislation started before Confederation and continued right on up into the 20th century was a massive assault on First Nations peoples and on First Nations women. Under the colonial uh, Aboriginal legislation, which was continued as the Indian Act of the Government of Canada, Aboriginal women had no right to participate in governance of Indian Act bans. They could not serve as electors and they could not hold office as band councillors or chiefs. Uh, they uh, suffered uh, in this way the imposition of European patriarchal governance. And this was a destruction of the major and significant role that Aboriginal women had played in traditional uh, governance of their peoples. Not uh, only was it uh, an imposition on the traditional role of Aboriginal women, but also other provisions of the Indian Act uh, made further incursions on that traditional role. Although there was no title to Aboriginal land available under the Indian Act, there was a form of possessory interest that was recognized, but it was only available to men. And Abri so Aboriginal women could never possess an interest in banned lands uh, under the Indian Act, nor could they inherit anything from their husbands or their fathers. And uh, so the uh, disenfranchisement or the, the alienation of Aboriginal women from their peoples by way of the, the marriage laws uh, was only a part of what was in effect a major, major attempt to remove Aboriginal women as significant factors in First Nations society. And what was not accomplished by the Indian Act uh, was um, further developed by the residential school system. It was an avowed aim of the residential schools sponsored and promoted by the Government of Canada to remove women, mothers and grandmothers and elders from having any influence over the life of Aboriginal children. And they were officially characterized as bad influences on the children whom the Canadian state wished to assimilate and what had not been done to reduce or remove their influence by way of the Indian Act was done deliberately by the residential schools. And the work that the Native Women's Association of Canada has been doing on their Sisters in Spirit campaign within the last couple of years has highlighted the lingering impact of this creation of Aboriginal women as legal nullities, because that is what the Canadian state did. They took away all the legal and social significance of Aboriginal women and created them as legally nothing. And the legacy of that creation is now seen in the huge, the very high crime rates against Aboriginal women, not just within Aboriginal communities, but also the white crime that is committed against Aboriginal women. Because the legacy of the colonial period of the legislation of the residential schools was the creation of a group of people in Canada that were seen and were sanctioned by law as being seen as fair game. And we have not recovered as a country and Aboriginal people have not recovered as nations from what was done by that deadly combination of the Indian Act and the residential schools. 
Let me focus a bit uh, on the uh, marriage rules and the uh, Indian status rules under the old Indian Act. And these um, prevailed until 1985. Uh, the two sections of the, night of the Act as it stood in 1985 that were affected by Bill C-31 were sections 11 and 12. Section 11 of the old Indian Act said that Indian status passed by way of the man, so that it was your father who gave you your Indian status. It was also your father who gave you your band membership. Because the, uh, and that was the legacy of section 11. And that also said that a, a, a man with Indian status who married a non-status uh, woman would give her his status. He would also give his wife his band so that a woman who married a man from a band different from her own would be categorized as having his band from then on. And this is an important uh, factor when we come to look at the legacy of Bill C-31. It was the assignment of women, status women, to different bands by the old legislation. So Section 12 dealt with women and basically said that if an a uh, status woman marries a non-status man, she loses her status, and then their children do not get status. And, and sometimes this is said as that the Indian woman's status was not strong enough to convey her status to her children. But what this in fact reflects is the structure of the old Indian Act that said that only men could ever give status. Because even when there was a status Indian couple who had children, those children got their status entirely from their father and they were put into his band. And the woman's Indian status was in effect, in effect legally irrelevant because that's how the Indian Act had created her as a legally irrelevant person within her family. And uh, so, that was the, uh, and then the section also said that um, if a woman had a child out of wedlock, then, as the quaint phrase of the day, then she could give her status to that child. That was the only situation in which the woman's status was recognized under the old act as meaning anything, when there wasn't a man in the picture. And ironically, and uh, unfortunately, that aspect of the old Indian Act also changed by Bill C-31. So let's look at Bill C-31 and what um, happened there. Um, the old rules of um, totally um, obliterating the, the status of women uh, were altered in some respects. Women who had lost their status for marrying out had it restored to them. But unfortunately, uh, the restoration at this first generation level was not continued on to the next generation. So that woman who got her status back, she, uh, her children were given their status back under Section 6.2 of the Act, but their status, whether they were a male or female children, um, was not legally strong enough to pass their status on to their children. It, was, it then became the rule that you had to, uh, if you were a 6-2 person, you had to marry somebody or have children with a 6-1. So because your status alone was not enough to give status to your children. And the other rule that was changed was uh, that now a woman who has a children and does not identify, ch children and does not identify the father is not allowed to pass her status on to them. So the only thing that women had under the old act has been taken away from them under the new act. And what we have instead is uh, a system which purports to restore status to the women who lost it under section 12, but has interfered so little with the basic structure of the old Indian act that that restoration of status is only good for about one and a half generations. It does not penetrate down any further than that. And the result is that um, there are 
uh, many, many children who are being born now who do not get Indian status under the new act because their parents do not have the right combination of uh, numbers opposite their name. They don't have enough 6-1 parents. So what this has done is just continued the discrimination against women that was in the old Indian Act, but it's dropped it down one generation. And uh, that discrimination is being challenged by a family uh, from a Mohawk family uh, who are challenging the fact that the restoration to status of the grandmother uh, restored to status her son, but her grandchildren who live on ancestral land that has been in the family for almost 200 years are not allowed to have status. And when they turn 18, they're going to have to leave their home. And um, so that's uh, a, a grim uh, account of what has been uh, done. I'd just like to mention one other aspect of the continuing legacy of uh, Bill C-31 um, and the, the harm that has resulted from the incomplete remediation of past discrimination. There was some recognition in Bill C-31 of the, of the um, sovereignty interests of First Nations, but not nearly enough. That was that um, Indian bands under the Act could pass their own membership codes, and those membership codes could be more generous about Indian status than the Act itself. But the federal government has uh, maintained its old funding habits and that is that an Indian band, First Nation, that has developed more generous membership rules than the ones the federal government believes are appropriate, will not get any grants or transfers for the people it includes as its members who are not regarded as members under the Indian Act. And so a band that wishes to behave in accordance with its traditional ways or in accordance with an enlightened view of who should be in its community is really brutally punished by the federal government uh, in, because it has more and more people to support and to house with less and less resources. So that's just a historical overview and I'll turn it over now to the next speakers to fill out the real human picture. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Lynn Gale, and I'm here today to talk about my experience as a litigant and community member regarding issues associated with the continued discrimination in the Indian Act. I remember well when I, heard the, when I first heard the Statement of Reconciliation on January 7, 1998, by the then Minister of Indian Affairs, Jane Stewart. When I first heard the apology, unlike for many Aboriginal peoples, I distinctly remember saying to myself, oh my goodness, someone is actually apologizing for, for what they did. <laughs> I grew up not knowing, who I wa not knowing who I was nor my place within the Canadian mosaic. The contradiction was that I secretly knew I was an Algonquin. As a young person, I spent many years in critical contemplation of what was happening around me. You see, through processes of policy and legislation, my father, his mother, who was my grandmother, my great-grandmother, and my great-great-grandmother, and myself were denied who we are and were. My father and grandmothers before him were Algonquin peoples, and thus, too, I am an Algonquin person. Our traditional territory consists of 36,000 square kilometers spanning from North Bay to Hawkesbury, Ontario. This land base includes Parliament Hill. Historically, the Algonquins here in Ontario have never signed a treaty relationship with the Crown. Thus, thus Canada's Parliament buildings squat on Algonquin land. This seems to be Canada's best kept secret, and so bear with me as I say it again. Canada's Parliament buildings squat on unsurrendered Algonquin land. Due to the gendering of Native identity via the Indian Act, my great-grandmother Annie 
and my grandmother were escorted off the reservation of Golden Lake, known today as Pickwakanagon. In 1945, Annie wrote a letter to Ottawa asking if she was counted as an Indian. Just a few weeks later, Indian agent H.P. Ruddy replied, explaining that when she married Joseph Gagne, a white man, she became a white woman. I hold this very document today, and it does indeed say, and you became a white woman. Interestingly, Joseph Gagne was native, though it was through his mother. Because his father was white, he too was considered a white person, and he in turn made my great-grandmother, Annie, a white person when she married him. <laughs> Alternatively, my great-grandmother became a white person because her mother-in-law married a white man. When the Indian Act was amended in 1985, I began the process of re-establishing a relationship with my Kokomis, which is grandmother in Algonquin, to determine who I was and where the Algonquin came from. I sent away for the necessary birth and marriage documents and eventually had my great-grandmother and grandmother reinstated as Indians under Section 61C and 62, respectively. You see, today we have different kinds or different levels of Indians. According to the Indian Act, 6-1 Indians are more Indian than 6-2 Indians. At this time, my father was denied registration because he was hit with what is known as the second generation cutoff rule, which, de which denies status to native peoples after two generations. The register applies these new rules retroactively to the children, of the children and grandchildren of enfranchised women, which is, of course, a problematic practice. In any case, I knew what I had to do, and so despite visual limitations, I began an archival research project at 77 Grenville Street here in Toronto, searching for my great-great-grandmother's family. My Kokomis told me a little bit about her. For example, she told me her name was Angeline Jocko, and she told me she was a black Indian, and that she adopted a little white boy named Moses Martel. After years of research, I found the necessary documents to have my great-great-grandmother, Angeline, established as a 6-1-C, and thus her son Joseph, a 6-2 Indian. As a result, my, grand my Kokomis was upgraded to a 6-1-F Indian. As <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> so, so bear with me. Um, <laughs> So she was upgraded to a 6-1-F Indian. She gained some power. <laughs> As both her parents, Annie and Joseph, were now considered Indians. My father, though, was registered as a 6-2 Indian because we don't know who his father was or is. And as a result of his unknown paternity, I was now hit with the second generation cutoff rule. Interestingly, there are no provisions in the current Indian Act in terms of how the registrar is to address issues of unknown paternity. Rather, the registrar simply applies a negative presumption of paternity to my unknown grandfather. That is, the registrar makes the assumption that my grandfather is or was a white person. In February 1995, after 10 years of work, I was denied entitlement to registration. I filed a protest with Indian Affairs, and in February 97, the register informed me that my name was correctly omitted from the Indian Registrar. It is now 2005 when my lawyers at Aboriginal Legal Services Toronto tell me that my case is heading towards discoveries in January 2006, and that it may proceed to trial in the year of 2007. It has been now over 20 years, and I'm still waiting to have this matter resolved. I've given you a lot of information, so let me simplify it all for you. If my grandmothers were instead grandfathers, I would be registered as an Indian, and my children too, if I had any, would be entitled to be registered. Specifically, we, my children and I, would be entitled to 61A status, which has a lot of power. <laughs> Needless to say, as a litigant and community member, I'm left perplexed for several reasons. First, because my reality of not knowing who my grandfather was, or is for that matter, is not a reality codified in the current Indian Act, I am just denied status registration. And I literally slipped through this I literally slipped through the space between the printed words on a page of a policy that someone else wrote. 
Second, I don't understand why the Register applies this new vagueness regarding issues of paternity in the 1985 Indian Act to my father's birth in a retroactive manner. For example, my father was born in 1935, and at that time children of unknown paternity born to Indian mothers were considered Indians. Third, if the Indian Act was amended in 1985 to bring it in line with the Charter of Rights, one would think that the denial of my registration due to, due to issues of my father's unknown paternity is contrary to the original intent and spirit of the amendments. Having said all this, I'd like to take some time to briefly explain to you that there are huge implications to what the Canadian government has done to the identity productions of Indigenous peoples in terms of the contemporary treaty and self-government process, as these policies are all connected. The Algonquins here in Ontario are in the process of trying to get back to treaty talks with the provincial and federal governments. After years of being denied who we are as Algonquins, through the treaty process, suddenly our identities are being affirmed via Algonquin law enrollment a process set in place to identify us. Disturbingly, the governments are interpreting this large number of Algonquin who continue to sign up as support for the treaty process when it in fact is more about identity affirmation. Algonquin law enrollment has become our new identity rites of passage. In this way, the history of the destruction of our cultural identities and the vulnerable position that it left many of us in is being harnessed and manipulated by the Canadian state. While at Trent University, I've been learning a lot about Indigenous philosophy, culture, and values. I was more than eager to learn about my grandmother's worldview because I had become so aware of the limitations and inadequacies of Western philosophy and values that merely roots reality in the physicalness of molecules and atoms, thus stripping the significant meaning that directs and guides people in constructive ways. I acquired this awareness through first-person experience when I was working for the Ministry of the Environment. Working there, I was trained in and equipped with a lot of sophisticated tools, as all technicians and scientists are. Despite this, the pollution kept coming. I discovered that water quality, Mother Earth's lifeblood, was ruled by industry and economics. Conversely, I discovered that in Western culture, there is little reverence or meaning for the Earth as our mother in a manner that would serve to guide people to make better, de de better decisions regarding her care. Located at Trent, I've learned that from an Indigenous perspective, the treaty relationships are about sharing land and resources. The treaty relationships are about negotiating a special relationship with other nations, and that these relationships are sacred and must be honoured, as our relationships with the earth must be. This differs substantially from the Western perspective, where negotiating a treaty with Indigenous peoples is about land rights extinguishment and the relinquishment of Indigenous rights. I'm having difficulty bringing this knowledge to the Algonquin peoples and to the negotiating process for many reasons, one of which is because I am a non-status, out-of-territory Algonquin. Another is because we have insecure leaders who manipulate and confuse the contradiction I pose in that I both challenge the Indian Act through the court system, while at the same time I advocate for equality rights be between status and non-status Algonquin people in our treaty process. In short, many Algonquins can understand that the results of my charter challenge could have national significance for many children, and that as a result, I simply cannot walk away from it because Algonquins may one day have a treaty. Succinctly, many Algonquin people do not understand my need to negotiate carefully this very difficult situation. As a result, who I am and the ideas I carry and continue to generate remain marginal. In this way, the discrimination of the Indian Act, past and present, has implications today. Going full circle now, as a result of my journey that I've been on in terms of my continued denial of status registration, combined with my insider knowledge of how disruption of Algonquin identity productions is having huge implications on the contemporary treaty process, the meaning of Canada's statement of reconciliation is shifting. Unfortunately today, and more and more as time goes on, I'm beginning to view the apology delivered by Jane Stewart as a fiction created by Parliament, the very Parliament that squats on Algonquin land. Miigwech. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, hi, I'm Ellen Monaig. I'm the status entitlement caseworker at Aboriginal Legal Services, and I've been uh, working there since uh, June of uh, 2003, so I've been there a couple of years now. Um, I was uh, previously employed at Indian Affairs as a registration officer, and uh, with that said, I have a little bit of inside information on how to get the application process happening with the clients. Um, I have a caseload of about uh, 200 files, status files, with uh, uh, Aboriginal Legal Services, and uh, a lot of these people, when they come in, they're uh, very, um, they're so, ex you know, they're so happy that they have someone to help them with the process because it's such a, it could be so intimidating, and um, so that's why I'm there. Um, what the, the things I want to touch on today mostly was the difficulties that we experience with some of the applications. And uh, uh, once, um, what, one thing I've noticed is uh, when I send in the applications and I get an, uh, an acknowledgement from Indian Affairs, they almost always say, we have found no record of any members in your family of, as being an Indian under the Indian Act. And then I, uh, uh, some of the files I've noticed, even with that letter, eventually they do get status. So. Um, I guess the, the key is to, you have to really stick, you know, stick to your guns and trying to find your uh, Aboriginal ancestry and find out where your band members are and your reserve. But um, uh, I guess the biggest difficulty I find is the time frame. It takes so long to get the, the status applications process. It takes um, about, they, they say um, a year and a half to two years, but it, it takes longer than that. I mean, uh, there's a few maybe uh, my clients that are lucky and got registered within a few months. <laughs> and we were just shocked when that happened. <laughs> but uh, a lot of time, uh, it, it's a long process and they gotta get documentation, birth documentation for themselves, their children, their ancestors, you know desperate against everything and, and they're just so intimidated by that process but we, we help them in that area we get it for them and and uh, even when we submit the applications to uh, Indian Affairs with the required information to get people registered they still send us oh we will look at it in due course and you know uh, just still take their time at it but um, um, I actually had one case where I did send them the, the uh, you know the information where they could get registered. I sent one to the registrar, I sent one to the, um, the officer in charge <clears throat> twice, and they both said they didn't get it. And I'm going, well, I faxed it, you know, my confirmation sheet says you got it. Why aren't you actioning on it? You know, you have something there that, that, that can get done. The file can be closed. <laughs> but anyway, I, I had a heated argument, so to speak, but a couple of days later, it was worth it. He said, okay, he's registered us. I was happy about that. <laughs> but and the, the um, another thing um, is uh, the majority of our clients are getting entitled under, getting registered under 6-2 or they're denied. And uh, we, we, ALSC believes that Indian Affairs, I think, goes out of their way to register people under 6-2 so, you know, so we could all die away. But um, we, we at ALSC actually go out of our way to find, you know, the entitlement in everybody's file to see if we, um, once the, an applicant gets denied or, or ha gets the registration particulars, we order the complete file from Indian Affairs from the um, uh, Access to Information Privacy Unit and they send us the copy, and we, we, you know, we go through it with a fine tooth comb and see if we can find loopholes. And sometimes we do, and or sometimes the clients will provide us with a, the necessary keywords or, or documentation to say, hey, look, it, this is uh, what we have, and you have it in your hands. So, I mean, um, it's it's a, it's an interesting process. I um I like uh, going into these uh, files and looking for loopholes and calling the clients, well, maybe, you know. But the, um, once, we, once we actually do get to the protest unit, that is another story. That, is, um, that in itself uh, takes six, 
at least six years before they even look at it. I mean, it's just a 20-year process, <laughs> I guess, and and um, we're, we dig deeper. We try and dig deeper for our clients. Another, um, another difficulty that um, came out with me was uh, uh, the, a lot of the people, a lot of the women who married non-natives never uh, reported this marriage and then kept their 6-1-A all this time. And then uh, I guess when they're, uh, or, or, or they thought they lost it or didn't know that the paperwork was never done or whatever, they, um, they, they go to apply, but they were already on the register. DIA actually downgrade, downgrades them. Even though there's no an order in council against them, it, it, they say, "Well, if we knew about it back then, you know, we would have done it then." But we were saying, "Well, today is today, and Indian Act today doesn't say that you can remove or downgrade somebody." So that's one of the arguments we always um, throw out. <laughs> and um, we 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 continue to argue that if uh, these women are reported. Their, marriaging, their marriages, we, 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 our stand is they should stay under 61A, you know, shouldn't be downgraded. And um, the last thing I want to mention is uh, Aboriginal Legal Services believes uh, um, uh, we should be housing all the applications there because we keep track of how uh, uh, the applicants get registered. And uh, uh, sort of uh, just to keep record of the process. And we don't turn anybody away when they call us and say, I have Aboriginal ancestry, can you help me? I, I usually tell them, you know, what the Indian Act says, like if, if your great-great-grandmother was native, blah, 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 this might happen. But we don't know exactly yet what's gonna happen until we get the ball rolling. So who knows, maybe they will get status and that gives them a little bit of hope when that happens. That's it. I mean, there's a lot more difficult things, uh, but these were the ones that stood out the most. Counselor at Alderville First Nation. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Law Society for inviting me here tonight to these very important discussions. I'd like to uh, thank Tracy for offering my name up as, a, as a, somebody to take part in these discussions. And I would like to uh, thank the Elder for the beautiful prayer and uh, the teaching that went with it. Congrats. My role in this afternoon's discussion is to share my views on the impact of First Nations of the 1985 Bill C-31 amendments. I would like to start with a statement made by Duncan Campbell Scott, Deputy Superintendent General of Indian Affairs in 1920, and I quote, our object is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic, and there is no Indian question and no Indian department. I uh, became interested in the issue of Indian status. Uh, I was born uh, an Indian at Alderville, First Nation. Both my parents were Indian. My grandparents were both Indian on my mother's side and the same thing on my father's side. I married an Indian woman from Alderville. Both her parents uh, were Indian and both her grandparents on both sides were Indian. And yet we lost our status. So we had nothing to do with losing it and we couldn't do anything about it. And uh, I kept telling my children that there would come a day when we'd all be reinstated, and they didn't believe me. And uh, 
it, we have, the, have to thank the uh, young Indian woman who uh, stood up for herself and, uh, and uh, brought about the important changes to the Indian Act in 1985. A positive aspect of Bill C-31 is the fact that its enactment was responsible for the reinstatement of Indian status to thousands of Indians who had lost status through various assimilation clauses contained in the pre-1985 Indian Act. I would be surprised, in fact, if there are not a number of people in this room this evening who regained their Indian status as a result of this bill. I think it's important to mention that fact. Having said that, Bill C-31, in my view, allows for the continuing discrimination against Indian women and legislates the extinction of status Indians at every First Nation in Canada. I can't offer you proof as to the validity of the second part of that statement, but what I can do is to relate to you some of the facts about what is going on at my own First Nation and thereby, I hope, cause you to start questioning whether or not we can afford to live with this bill much longer. Let's say I first started to question this bill in 1985, short, shortly after it became law, because of the fact that I had spent a good part of my, I was born an Indian and spent a good part of my life as a non-status Indian, restated with this bill. I was very anxious to see how Canada would welcome all these Indians back into the fold and, uh, and abandon uh, a hundred-year-old policy uh, of assimilating Indians. And uh, my background is insurance. Uh, I had my own uh, insurance, marine insurance adjusting company, so I was familiar with reading uh, clauses, legal clauses. Uh, and, uh, but it took me about four readings of this bill before it hit me that there is a, there is a genocide clause attached to it. And uh, from then on, I, I started to uh, speak out about this. It, uh, Alderville First Nation went from 238 people in 1985 and then the bill passed, and our population immediately, overnight, tripled. So to have some going around saying, we have a problem, we're, we're going to uh, uh, become extinct, who's going to listen to you? Uh, I had somebody say, we've got wall-to-wall -wall Indians here. We don't know how we're going to look after them all. And, and uh, so it was very difficult for me to make that point, but uh, you're... Uh, through discussions like this, we're getting awareness out there of what's going on, the real story, and that's why these uh, discussions are so very important. Uh, <clears throat> For those of you who might not be aware of how the two-generation cutoff works, an outmarriage occurs when an Indian marries a non-Indian or non-status Indian spouse. When there is outmarriage in two successive generations, children born to parents of the second out marriage will be born without status. I believe most First Nations have a high out marriage rate and that is why this bill will bring about the extinction of status Indians. That's why I believe that's going to happen. I was a member of the Alderville Elders Council. Uh, the, uh, the chief and council asked us to form a group, and, and it was an informal group. We volunteered, and, and, and we had meetings, and this issue preoccupied our meetings, I can tell you. And uh, we wrote to every First Nation in Canada and asked for support for First Nation control of the determination of Indian status. And uh, we sent this to the chief of 634 First Nations. 
we got 24 responses and uh, although that is a small number, every one of the responses expressed support for our position. Alderville is one of eight First Nations comprising the United Nation of Egg Councils. The UAC had been attempting to negotiate a self-government agreement with Canada for almost two decades. I was hired by our band to act as liaison between our people, the elected council, and the negotiation team. As part of that process, we were able to have a study carried out to determine what our status Indian population might look like in the future. Ogemawai's Tribal Council was asked to conduct this study, and I specifically asked them to predict when the last status Indian birth will take place at Alderville. According to the OTC study, the last status Indian birth will take place at Alderville in the year 2032. This is really the beginning of the end for status Indians because once status Indian children cease to be born, attrition takes over and as the remaining Indians who have status die out and are not placed. Following this study, a second joint Canada-UAC study was undertaken. Even though a different methodology was used, this second study predicted with disturbing similarity that the last status Indian birth will take place at Alderville in the exact same year, 2032. The predicted date of the last status birth, Indian birth at the other seven UAC, UAC First Nations is as follows. Scugog Island, 2013. Hiawatha, 2036. Georgina Island, 2037. Moose Deer Point, 2039. Menjikening, 2062. Beausoleil, 2075. Curve Lake, 2082. So a lot of status Indians are dying out. There will still be lots of Indians around. What does all this mean? What this means for Alderville is that every child born after the year 2032 will be born without important rights, hunting and fishing, tax immunity, access to on-reserve housing, non-insured health benefits, post-secondary education, assistance, and a host of other rights which status Indians will continue to enjoy. Government funding, because it is based on the per capita number of registered Indians belonging to the First Nation is being phased out at a rate that is directly proportional to the rate at which status Indians are becoming extinct. A government prepared list of all the rights which are dependent upon status is a, uh, I've attached to this paper is a four pages of rights. Uh, I only mentioned the ones that are most familiar to us. The United Nations. In 1996, the United Nations Human Rights C Committee warned the Canadian Human Rights Committee, which in turn warned the, the Government of Canada, under the heading The Unfinished Business of Bill C-31 that the Bill C-31 amendments still allow for the continuing discrimination against women. The UN has threatened Canada with a second formal censure on the same issue, which prompted the first formal censure back in the early 1980s. <clears throat> in fact, Bill C-31 was Canada's response to that formal censure. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples has this to say about uh, the issue of Indian status. Bill C-31 allows for the reinstatement of those who lost their Indian status under the old rules and gives Indian status to their children. However, the process and criteria of first-time registration are confusing and still offensive because the authority to determine who can be registered as an Indian still lies with the federal government, not Aboriginal people. And another quote, Given enough time and enough marriages outside status boundaries, status Indians could disappear completely as a category. And a final quote, the determination of Indian status is not the business of Canadian governments. Members of the Alderville Elders Council often wondered whether or not a large reserve such as Six Nations would survive. In 1998, I distributed a copy of a lead article in the on the status issue which appeared in the Turtle Island News. 
The headline reads, Six Nations Becoming a Reserve Without Indians, and makes the point that 50 years' time there will be no status Indians in the Six Nations. Alderville's outmarriage rate is 90%. Six Nations' outmarriage rate, according to this article, is 82.5%. This article begs the question, if a reserve of 20,000 people, Indians can't, can be expected to survive, how are the smaller ones going to survive? And uh, again, I'm attaching a copy of that uh, Six Nations article. And this appeared in 1998. Turtle Island News is our newspaper. No, uh, <clears throat> Alderville's withdrawal from the UAC self-government process. In the end, Alderville and three other First Nations withdrew from the UAC self-government initiative referred to earlier. The agreement failed to address the loss of rights to future generations brought about by the extinction of status Indians, and Canada was not prepared to relinquish control of status to the First Nations. We viewed self-government with some other nation dictating to us who our citizens are to be a contradiction in terms. We felt we had no choice but to abandon this process. The Williams Treaty, 1923, that's Alderville's treaty. Alderville presence, presently suing the Government of Canada for its failure to live up to its obligations in the 1923 Williams Treaty. A few years back, one of our members pointed out to me that the treaty contains a clause which stipula stipulates that should any of the signing First Nations become extinct, the land will revert to the province of Ontario. We lost approximately 13 million acres of land in this treaty. Thereafter, Alderable was con confined to a reserve of mere 3,600 acres. The other six First Nations were similarly displaced which brings to mind a quote from Seneca, a Roman senator, who said, so strong a force is avarice that it is not within the power of abundance to satisfy it. Constitution. Section 35 of the Constitution states that the existing Aboriginal treaty and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada is hereby recognized and confirmed and affirmed. I have always believed that this section protects the rights of First Nations to determine who their citizens are. In my view, to argue otherwise is to, to support the peculiar notion that Indians did not have the right to determine who belonged to their tribes prior to contact with the Europeans. I know we have a lot of lawyers here and uh, I, I couldn't resist raising this issue. I hope. Uh, one of you will comment on this. Uh, I, I've always wondered about this. And finally, the 1969 White Paper. The aims of the 1969 White Paper that was referred to earlier. Number one, the dismantling of, of the Department of Indian Affairs. Number two, the transfer of the responsibility for Aboriginal affairs to the provinces. Number three, the removal of the protection afforded to reserve lands. Four, an end to the treaties. And five, the elimination of the legal status and rights of Indian peoples. Bill C-31, when you think about it, accomplishes all the aims of the 1969 White Paper. We need to ask ourselves, where is the united Canada-wide resistance from our people? that brought about the demise of the 1969 White Paper. I believe we must resist this bill with the same resistance and strength the warriors of our forefathers would have displayed in dealing with an enemy encamped in our territory bent on our destruction. Thank you for inviting me. Miigwech. I'd like to uh, thank each of our uh, panelists for their uh,
comments and their insight into dealing this issue. We had Mary who spoke to us and uh, gave us an outline of the historic and ongoing assault on the legal and social significance of Aboriginal women. Lynn talked about her 20-year personal experience in seeking government recognition of her Indian status. Ellen spoke to us about the difficulties in dealing with the applications for individuals who are trying to get, regain their Indian status or gain recognition of their status. Uh, and Wayne touched on a whole range of issues and reminded us of Duncan Scott's statements regarding ensuring that there was no Indian problem. He talked about the genocide clause that was in the Bill C-31 uh, amendment to the Indian Act and in the end uh, advised us or reminded us that the 1969 white paper that was a, you know, rallied people across the country, Aboriginal communities across the country to oppose it. The goals in that 1969 white paper have been achieved through the amendments in Bill C-31 to the Indian Act and challenges us to take up that same fight, united fight, to oppose those changes and to uh, stop the negative impact on our communities. Now, I had advised earlier that there would be time to ask questions, and now is the time. There's a microphone in the center here. Uh, the purpose of the microphone is to allow your voices to uh, carry through the room so everyone can hear your questions. So please don't be shy to use it, unless you've got a real loud voice and can yell from your spot. Uh, <laughs> please use the microphone. Uh, so I invite you to come up to the microphone and ask questions. And if you could, so that we can address you properly, would you state your name before uh, your question? Okay, I'm not shy, but I'll still use the microphone. <laughs> uh, my name is Lorraine Land. I practice Aboriginal law with Oltheus Clear Townsend. Um, thank you, panelists. Uh, that was very informative, and I really appreciated the different perspectives. And the question that I have is, um, one that I wrestle with in talking to people who, uh, from communities that are not uh, recognized, Aboriginal communities not recognized bands, or uh, communities that have been disenfranchised from recognized bands for some time. And well, I, rec I recognize on the one hand um, what you're saying about how fundamentally important it is that self-determination for Aboriginal communities includes the right to determine who the members of the community should be. Um, I wonder how you deal with the concern that some people have that um, when, when uh, bands control the membership, that that can be used in a way that is also oppressive to, um, to exclude people from membership um, because uh, for, for various reasons, for, for instance, uh, for economic reasons, uh, not wanting to share resources if it's a resource wealthy community. Um, there is good reason to want to restrict your band membership list um, in order to, to control your resource flow to community members if they're going to be disadvantaged by more people coming in. So I'm wondering if you could just comment a little bit on that tension between on the one hand recognizing the self-determination issue, the legitimacy of having control over band membership. Um, and on the other hand, this dynamic that, that people are concerned about where oppressive exclusion could happen under a self-determining uh, structure where bands do control their membership in ways that exclude people for reasons that are, are questionable. Thank you. I'll just, uh, since the question wasn't directed at anyone, I'll allow the uh, panelists to uh, answer in turn or... I don't have any answer, but I agree that it's a serious question. Uh, one of the things that um, is involved in this very long-running Saw Ridge challenge to Bill C-31 that started you know, over t about 20 years ago now is this very thing. Um, Saw Ridge is asserting that an element of its uh, Aboriginal right to self-governance is the right to um, identify its own members but um, there is um, quite a bit of evidence on the record that this right is not, hasn't been and will not in the future be used to expand entitlement to what, what is a very large pool of oil riches, now diversified into a very large pool of oil and other riches. And um, one of the problems in the area is that the approach that has been taken by Canada to this 
whole question has meant that there has been little or no attention to the development of means that would be fair ways of addressing your question. The only means that now exist are the Canadian Charter, uh, in particular Section 15 and Section 35.4 of the uh, Constitution Act. And those are untested and fairly blunt. Uh, there's been no development by Aboriginal communities, say, of an Aboriginal Bill of Rights, which was an idea that was floated at one point that would um, uh, involve um, buy-in by First Nations into their own way of being fair that had been developed by First Nations themselves. There, that was an idea that was floated at the time of the Charlottetown Accord and had been around for a while before that and no work has been done on it because Canada doesn't want to encourage that sort of thing. It's happy. It remains happy that there are these conflicts because it means that there can be no common front against what's happening in the Indian Act. And that's, that's my take on it. Uh, I'll have a go at it. I, I understand the uh, concern and uh, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People talks about it. Uh, definitely, you would not want uh, male-dominated uh, bands to uh, discriminate against women again. There would have to be some checks and balances. There needs to be a dialogue mm -hmm. and uh, bands have to remember that a lot of the uh, reinstated Indians are going to have a vote. And uh, <clears throat> in our First Nation, uh, for every on-reserve Indian, we have two and a half off-reserve Indians. So uh, anything we uh, try to bring in that's going to require a referendum uh, type ratification, which I would expect that's how this would come about, is going to have to uh, uh, take that into account, that, that, that these people. And I, I think that you would have to have the dialogue and then uh, put our minds together and work this out so that there wouldn't be uh, discrimination. But I, I, it's a good question. I, I don't have the answer. Okay. Other questions, comments? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, this is a question uh, directed for Mary Everts. Um, my name is Susan Fleming. I'm from Nova Scotia. I'm a poet and a writer. I get involved in Aboriginal issues in Nova Scotia. I was instructed by a, a medicine man there to learn about the medicine wheel, and it's brought me quite a long ways. But I'm particularly quite interested in uh, the lack of information available, uh, say, in the school system about natives. Um, I had a couple of words in a history book about natives living in teepees and sleeping on fur boughs. That's all I knew. And um, I, I, I'm just trying to think here what my... Uh, and I was very interested to hear about the, the, uh, the laws that were, were passed to deny the, this matriarchal society and to break up the, the matriarchal society. Uh, but I was wondering uh, what do you think can be done about, uh, well, I think that this, the answer is to, to uh, actually uh, promote more understanding, cross-cultural understanding just about native ways of life. And one particular case stands out, the Donald Marshall case in Nova Scotia, and he was convicted specifically because he used a, a certain posture in, in his questioning. For instance, he didn't look directly at the peace, police officer, and they considered him guilty. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, what you could suggest, like, as, say, for non-native people to inform themselves of, of native ways, or what, what can be done to actually promote more understanding between uh, different segments of society? Anyone else can answer that as well. <laughs> and this is one way which I realize helps, but I was just wondering if people had other ideas. So. Oh. I'll start out. I'm sure that other panelists have um, uh, answers or co uh, comments as well. Um, I, I'm not sure that I accept the premise of your question, and I'm, I'm going to try to explain that. Um, 
I think really what needs to be done more is that um, the Canadian state and white society, and I'll use the term settler society, although it encompasses not just the people who came before 1800, but successive generations of people who've come onto this land. I, th I think that we really need to clean our own house instead of um, learning or trying to just forget about that part and become kind of very belatedly understanding and empathetic about First Nations. I think we actually need to face the music and to acknowledge what we did uh, in the residential schools and so that the religious denominations in Canada should just bite the bullet and make their contributions to residential school reparations and the Canadian state should do the same thing and the Canadian state should stop trying to continue assimilationist policies that it started before Confederation and tried on in 1969 and is still trying on. But I don't really think that we will get anywhere unless uh, the non-Aboriginal people in Canada uh, acknowledge how awful our conduct has been. And that's the first step. And we can learn all we want about the four directions and about Aboriginal ways, but unless we acknowledge what we've done, I think we're just going to be sort of wannabes or weekend understanders. So that's my piece. <laughs> Um, I, I could just say I had a real problem with grade 9 history. It was a compulsory course and <clears throat> I failed it twice, had to take it a third time and it, it, was, it, was, it was an awful course and so you ask what, what can we do to um, improve or the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. I'd have to say we should look at high school curriculum and probably public school. I would like to see, um, if, for example, in the Algonquin Treaty process, I would like to impact the school per curriculum. I would like that to be part of my treat our treaty process if we get there. Um, I'm not just interested in, in uh, relinquishing my rights and, my, and the land. I want to improve, improve the relationship. Um, another thing I think that's really important is that Indigenous people have a different understanding of knowledge and a different practice of knowledge. That for Indigenous people, knowledge is a journey, and every student takes their own journey and their own path to that knowledge, and they have a responsibility to, to acquire that knowledge. And, and that's very different than a, in a Western system where you put 30 kids in a class and you say, you're going to learn this whether you want to or not. <laughs> so um, I would have to say um, that there's a fundamental philosophical difference there. And also, um, one of the things that I, I think is really important, if you want to understand indigenous philosophy, indigenous way of life, is to look at the value system. We call them, or the Anishinaabe call um, our seven values of, of kindness, respect, bravery, honesty, truth, and sharing, and, and I can't remember the last one, but they're referred to as the seven grandfather teachings. We use those values to guide us in, in everything we do. And that is quite different than, for example, what the Ten, Ten Commandments do, is they only tell you what you can't do. They don't give you any guidance. And those teachings are fundamental, I think, even in terms of interpreting policy and legislation. So, as I said, I slipped through the cracks, or slipped through the space of the printed words on a policy. And that's because they were being interpreted from a very Western perspective. If they were being interpreted from the perspective of kindness and bravery and honesty, those fundamental values, then I probably wouldn't be here today. So that's a fundamental teaching that I think um, is really important if you want to understand an indigenous worldview. Next okay. Well, uh, I, I think uh, Lynn's suggestion that we teach it in the schools is an excellent suggestion. I mean, uh, if we're not teaching it, we ought to be, for sure. And uh, if we ever gain control of uh, our education system, like the Union of Ontario Indians is trying to do, 
uh, in their negotiation process, then we'll be able to do that. Uh, at least teach our own children anyway. Uh, that, that would be excellent because children are fair. Uh, and, and they would see the injustice of that right away. And the other thing is, um, it's amazing, my non-native friends, when I talk to them about this, they, first of all, just can't believe it. They just don't believe that it happened. And uh, when they do finally uh, become convinced that it happened, then they're, they come on site. We, we had the British Broadcasting Corporation in Alderville for two days on this issue. They, got, they, they heard about a, a website that originated in Alderville trying to get uh, native people together. It was like a dating service. And they're over here to, to uh, looking into same-sex marriage. And, and they fool around on a computer and looking at websites, and they found this one. And, and they phoned uh, the, the man that set this dating service up and said, what's that all about? And, and so we're trying to encourage people to marry uh, uh, Indians, so we'll, we, you know, we'll stop this assimilation policy, this genocidal policy that uh, the government's taken. And, and, uh, but he couldn't explain it. He, uh, and so they ended up calling me. And uh, I said, uh, you're welcome to come to Alderville. But before you come, let me send you some information on it so you can, you can prove to yourself that this is factual information that can't be disputed. And uh, so these, uh, these people spent two days in Alderville, and they went away educated. Uh, they, they had a, movie, a television camera there and, and the whole bit. Uh, I just got a call the other night from the CBC they're interested in this issue because they went to the Northumberland Federal Liberal Association and I'm on the executive of Northumberland Liberal Association and it's one of the main issues uh, with our organization, the issue of uh, First Nation control of status. And, uh, but it took me four years to convince uh, my colleagues on, on the uh, executive committee that this was needed. So it, it's an education process, and, and the more discussions that we have about it, the, the talk openly about it, and confront the government at every opportunity. Don't let the government get away. Make sure the government knows that you know what they're doing. I never, <laughs> ever miss an opportunity to, to tell a government official, I know exactly what they're doing. I know where you're coming from, and, uh, and that helps. You know. So there's, we just have to, it, it, and the, the awareness is just starting to come. So we're, we're just catching up now. But for us, it's not, there's nothing theoretical about this genocidal clause. We have 100 kids at Alderville who have been born since 1985 who don't have these rights. So there's nothing theoretical about it. And uh, it's reality. Sorry, again, like another, you just want a little bit more information. Um, what would it cost for a 6.1? Is there a difference in 6.2? Like, does the gover like how much money does the government save by, by removing from 6.1 to 6.2? And how many treaties would be outstanding right now in Ontario that you've been waiting and waiting and waiting to settle? Yeah, so how, like how many other groups? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that any of the panelists would uh, speak on behalf of the government with respect to the cost savings between 6-1 and 6-2 Indians. Uh, for purpose of providing programs and services, uh, if you're a status Indian, those programs and services are limited. It's not 100% uh, funding for housing or for medical services or anything like that. But the uh, cost saving is if you're a non-status Indian, the government pays nothing. So that, that's the cost saving. It's from you know, paying for certain programs and services, and Wayne uh, listed some of those, uh, post-secondary education, housing, uh, on-reserve education, things like that. But the cost savings to the government is 100% because if there are no status Indians, 
then there's no payments being transferred. Uh, the other question with the outstanding treaties, uh, you know, I'm, Lynn? I'm a very, um, I guess, egocentric knower. And so I can only talk about the Algonquin land claim, or treaty process, rather. And I, I prefer to call it now a treaty relationship. And um, it's an outstanding issue. And I think if I was to, to talk about that, my biggest, well, I have a few concerns about that. One is the issue of our identity and how so many of us are in a vulnerable location because of what the state has done and how that's being kind of manipulated. But I think the, the um, bigger thing I would like to talk about in terms of the Algonquin Treaty process, because I can't, as I said, I can't speak about how many are outstanding. You can go to the INAC website or the ONAS website and, and they'll tell you that information. Um, but the thing I would like to say is that um, my concern with the, tr with, uh, the treaty process is they're going to force us to give up the land. And you shouldn't be forced to give up the land. We should be entering into a new relationship where we share the land and we share the resources. We should not be forced to give up the land because we, we don't own that land and that's a fundamental component of our philosophy. But, you know, it's so, such a one-sided situation. Um, yeah, I, I just comment that uh, six one and the six two have, have the same rates. So, so um, I mean, uh, a six two can't pass its status on, but in terms of government services, six one gets the same as a six two in terms of government service. The other question on uh, uh, on the treaty, I'm not just exactly sure what that is about. Oh, the number of outstanding treaties. Uh, that, that information is available. You can easily find it and uh, how much the government has reserved uh, uh, to deal with these claims. Uh, it's, it's a very, very slow uh, process. But there is one interesting uh, study <clears throat> that was done by the uh, National Post and <clears throat> they wanted to know why there was a black market in status Indian cards. Uh, and so they put a reporter on it. And, and this reporter, uh, he only looked at two aspects of, of what it, uh, of the benefits. He looked at uh, the non-insured health benefit and tax exemptions. And he said it's worth $8,000 a year. This card is worth $8,000 a year to an Indian, a status Indian. And uh, if, you, if you consider that the average person lives to the age of 70, that works out to five hundred sixty thousand dollars, and uh, so if you get rid of a, a one status in then the government's substantial saving. And remember, that's just those two aspects uh, of the rights. There's others. There's a whole economic benefit to to uh, being having a business on a reserve. Okay. Next question. Hello, my name is Bonnie Kenny. <coughs> I live in Oshawa. Um, my mother's people come from Waku Island, the Jacobs family. My father's people come from the Loretto um, Reserve outside of Montreal, or what is now called the village of the Windot Huronian people. Um, I had status. And um, when it came out that we had to renew our status every two years, I used to laugh at that and say, um, What's that all about? Are we not going to be Indians in two years? Mm -hmm. Well, Creator has a way of answering our questions because my status was uh, revoked. Reason being, not proven. My grandmother is on the tribal council and uh, tribal records in Wallaceburg, and so is my father's mother. I get a letter stating that I have to now um, pay a lot of money to get birth certificates, death certificates, um, marriage certificates. Since 1999, I have been trying to get these certificates. They will not give me my father's certificate because I can't prove he's dead. I don't know where my father is. I know his name, his birth date, his parents' name, where he was born. But I cannot get that piece of paper stating that, that birth certificate because I can't prove he's dead. They won't give me that certificate. What do we do? What do we do? 
What do we do with this? I think all of this government, and I'm not going to say uh, how I feel, because it's not probably <laughs> acceptable, even though uh, I'm pretty sure much of, uh, most of us would know a chosen word here. But I think our dealings with the government is based on two things, and that's materialism and money, <laughs> and no respect. And I have grandchildren who have native parents are from it's a Serpent River, and they say now that my grandchildren need to be adopted by a band, either from Serpent River, where their father is from, or if I get my status reinstated. Uh, this is a painful thing they do. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to fight them. And also, they have no problem taking the money that they require for such certificates. And if they cannot produce them because I can't prove my father's dead, they don't return my money. Mm -hmm. And I'm very upset. And we have enough in our lifetimes with, with guilt and shame, trying to be proud of who we are. And it comes down to wanting land and mm -hmm. money. <laughs> And as a grandmother of my grandsons, I am horrified in this year of 2005 that we have to stand and speak about our pain regarding who we are. Because now I am a nothing and a nobody, or so they like to think. But I have something to say, and I don't know what I'll do, but I will let it be known that whatever they're doing is absolutely wrong. And I think it's all in the process of truly eliminating us. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. Um, Ellen, did you want to address that? <laughs> I have a business card for you. <laughs> I can certainly help you. Okay. okay. Come see me later. Okay, Ellen, talk to her. Good. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Andre Morso with Aboriginal Voices Radio. And uh, two words come to my mind, and it's law and society right now. And I'm wondering, in 1969, when they were doing the white paper, how many Aboriginal lawyers did we have in the country then? And I'm very hopeful in wondering, how many Aboriginal lawyers do we have in the country now? Because to me, it sounds like we need more numbers to fight the fight, because this sounds like a major fight. So do we have hope in fighting fire with fire? I mean, it sounds like, you know, it's a legal battle. Do you know this? Is that, number in, is that number increasing? Is it a good number? Yeah, I can tell you that um, I'm a member of the Indigenous Bar Association. The Indigenous Bar Association is a national organization who has as its members individuals of Aboriginal ancestry who are uh, schooled in uh, law schools. And the, in 1969, there may have been a handful of lawyers, if there were any, called by that time. But I, or, yeah. And I can tell you now, though, that the numbers have increased significantly. Every year in uh, the law schools in Canada, there's an increasing number of Aboriginal students, uh, increasing number of lawyers who are called to the bar. And they're, you know, if you go by the um, membership of the Indigenous Bar Association as an indication, you know, there would be over a thousand uh, now who are currently registered as members. And that's from across the country. So the numbers are significantly increasing. Uh, addressing this issue, you know, fighting the fight, you know, th that's the purpose of this discussion is to open people's minds to, uh, you know, the impacts of this significant decision to uh, amend the Indian Act. Thank, Thank you. you. And we have other comments. Yeah. I'm really tempted to add something. Uh, there is an increasing number of Aboriginal uh, graduates of law schools and Aboriginal lawyers, but many of the fights that need to be fought 
um, need to be funded as well because uh, no matter how talented and dedicated the graduate and the lawyer might be, um, they can't live on air. And there is at present no reliable funding for any of these fights. And one of the things that established um, law firms can do is to open their pro bono coffers to these kinds of challenges. And if there are any uh, members of large law firms here or anyone from the Law Society who is interested in the pro bono dimension, this is a really good way of um, getting into the pro bono uh, service area because uh, these kinds of challenges to um, the um, Indian Affairs Department are up, you're up against people who have long pockets and long timetables and they don't care if it takes 25 years. That's their timeline. So uh, I think it's really important not just to have the dedicated and talented professionals but for lawyers and non-lawyers to explore ways of funding these challenges. The other thing I'm really hopeful about is the, uh, is the United Nations. Um, Canada doesn't like to get censured on a human rights issue, and, and that's what they're facing. I mean, the, the Human Rights uh, Committee of the UN warned Canada in 1996, uh, so we're talking about nine years now, and they never forget something. They may be slow, and, and uh, uh, that formal censor may be a long time coming, but they'll never forget. I mean, the Dudley George inquiry uh, is happening because of the, the, the UN uh, can, kept on to it. And uh, Canada routinely travels around the world scolding other, first, uh, other <laughs> nations about human rights violations, perceived human rights violations. And, and um, so Canada doesn't like it when, when the, the UN uh, issues a formal censure on human rights issues. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm hopeful of that, that part of it will eventually play out if it doesn't happen before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a great presentation. It really brought back to me uh, it was one of the first issues I'd ever been involved in was Bill C-31 or the Laval Corbier case. Um, my name is Anne Bracape. I'm an Algonquin First Nation woman who was born 121B but became 61A. <laughs> and uh, my late friend Gary Corbier, who fought the very famous Corbier case, uh, would send me reams and reams of um, what I call toilet paper because my fax machine was one of those terminal papers. <laughs> Just read this and we'd spend hours, four o'clock in the morning talking and he was very exuberant. But all this to say that I had gone to court with him a couple of times and said, asked him, you know, in court they always talk about Bill C-31, but you're Bill C-31, I'm Bill C-31, your father's Bill C-31. And he said, what? I said, yeah, well, we just didn't disintegrate into nothing. 121A, 121B Indians became uh, 61A. So that um, this is something that has to be kind of reminded to people that, you know, oh, the Bill C-31 Indians are taking up all the housing, the Bill C-31, well, I'm Bill C-31. Anyways, um, the federal government, I was really shocked, like over the years and, and the impact of Bill, Bill C-31, over the years, um, I found out, quite interestingly, that the federal government financed, fully financed and proactively solicited a First Nation, and you'll have to read the transcripts at court transcripts, exactly what happened. I was flabbergasted to find out that they had solicited actively a First Nation to, to uh, uh, support their side. Just leave you with that and you might do some research, make this more interesting. Now I'll also tell you that I also worked in the federal government many different departments. I think at one point I counted a good 15. And a couple of royal commissions. And one of the things is bureaucrats have discretionary power. Just, just so you know that they can make things slow and they can make them fast. They do have, they can put things aside and they can lose things. And I'll tell you, my cousin works in Ottawa and she says, I don't believe the onus is on the person to 
demonstrate that I have Indian status. A lot of times we have the information, but they don't need to know that I'm going to push, the, push it a little bit faster. Anyways, discretionary power in the, in the bureaucracy. Um, Bill C-31 is a self-identification of, of, of aboriginality, which also permeates the public uh, policy, government policy. For example, training, employment, uh, funding for housing, a whole community just outside Quebec. I'm from Kitigan CB, north of, um, of Ottawa, which is Algonquin territory also, along with uh, Golden Lake. Um, and a whole non-native community became na native because they had us housing, Bill C-31. We didn't even know who they were. And they said they were Algonquin. So the thing is self-identification. Anyone can now claim to be native. Just say you're native, you are. Um, curriculum in history, and I know this from a personal fact that my son had us um, uh, a history project or immigration, it had to do with him immigration. And the teacher would not accept the fact that he, couldn't, he wasn't going to be doing a, a, a presentation on immigration. He said, well, I can't. I can't because I didn't immigrate. Yes, you did. They were adamant that my son immigrated because everybody else did. They're from <laughs> wherever. And my son had to come home. I had to settle with the teacher. said he can't do it. Why not? Well, because he's not an immigrant. Oh, never thought about that one. Anyways, <laughs> one, one of the things I'd like to... Can, uh, that's been bothering me for a little while because of the Bill C-31 issue is the portability of Bill C-31. I recently phoned Ellen about this. My father passed away, st full status Indian, and uh, had no land under reserve, but was buried under reserve. I, everything else he was status. He was, allowed to, he was born under reserve, buried under reserve. The only thing is his b a bank account. He's considered a, an Ontario citizen. So, I have to, so can't go to Indian Affairs for any of that um, you know, closure on, on his bank account, he's treated as a Ontario citizen. And I don't accept that. I don't accept that Indian Affairs. So what I want to do is contest this. I'm going to look into it more. Is the mobility rights or the portability of Bill C-31. And I think that was about it. Now, the only thing I'd add is a few years ago, uh, my mother said to me, Watch who you marry. And I said, what do you mean? She says, well, this is the reality. And she talked about losing rights. So when I became older, I decided that the one very criteria I would have to have children was would be the partner would have to be 12-1-B. And he was. We're both status Indians. So all our five kids are 12 So I'm safe. Oh, not so safe. I had to tell my kids a few months ago that if you marry a non-native, you know that your kids will be. So, they said, well, what do we do, mom? I said, well, I might have to adopt them, or your brother might have to adopt your niece. That's the reality of what we're facing. So we constantly face, so I think what I'm saying is to be an Indian in Canada today is that it's a political statement. You know, that's, all, that's what that is, it's a politically loaded statement. I am Indian. Any question? Thank you, Anne. The, uh I know that there's a number of questions and we're, we are running into, the, we were supposed to start an evening reception and I was supposed to give you a chance to have something to eat, <laughs> something to drink <laughs> before uh, the evening speakers uh, came to address you. Um, we've got maybe 10 minutes before the evening speakers come, so if the next three could just ask questions and if the panelists could address those and I really don't mean to cut this short because it's not important but we have uh, others who are, have been invited this evening to address us and we have uh, some performers as well and I don't want you to miss out on that. Uh, my name is Amber Crow and I'm a member of the Mississaugas of Rice Lake Alderville First Nation where Wayne is a elected member of council and I've sat on the a committee that he spoke of that has spent many, many, many hours discussing the issue of status extinction under C-31. Um, one of the things that we come back around to often is what's being done, and I know some of the things have been touched on as to what can be done, but more so we've been talking about the problem. And so I just wanted to ask specifically, uh, Mary, about the um, parent case, because you mentioned the um, 
the Mohawk family that was challenging it under Section 15, and I've read the case, but I was under the impression that it was um, sort of shelved when it didn't get certified as a class action. So if you could just update us on where that's at and how, um, oh yeah, and I'm a third year law student, <laughs> and whether or not, um, whether or not we can um, see an end to that litigation and maybe Lynn's litigation and uh, when that might be. Lynn gave you uh, an idea of the timeline in her litigation which um, sees documentary production and discovery going on in 2006-7 and actually the Perron case is moving through the court system more or less at the same time as Lynn's case with it. They've bundled the two together for purposes of going through the court system and it's taking forever because on the one side, the plaintiff side, we don't have very much documentation to provide and it's really all personal to the families. But on the government side, they actually have a whole package of CDs that they send you with their Bill C-31 standard document package and then they have their variations on their document packages and they're always trying to slow things down because they don't want this um, to be uh, litigated. They don't want it to be resolved. So it's on a very, very long timetable and we were hoping that if we got the Perron class action certified, they would have to sit down at the table and deal with us. But when we didn't get certified, the judge kind of left the door open and said, well, after you win the charter action, you can come back and get certified for purposes of you know, the remedy applying to everybody, but um, that's just going to be, you know, forever. So I'm not very hopeful. I mean, I think we've just kind of settled in for a lifetime cruise here. Mm -hmm. I think the delay is right. Next question. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you to you all. My name is Michael Kerr. I work with the National Anti-Racism Council of Canada, and I'm interested in the, I guess, the political fight in terms of um, how we can build together broader, deeper political constituency uh, and solidarity. Because I'm thinking in terms of newcomer communities, set, settler society. And although in the presentations it was, it was constructed in a, in a more of a, uh, a bipolar kind of uh, white settler and, and First Nations indigenous, uh, certainly in, in many parts of Canada now, certainly in, in Toronto, what is now Toronto, the, the ethno-racial demographic is very different. And I think within that, in terms of the, the 50%, although different statisticians give us different numbers, many now believe that we have crossed the threshold, 50% of the population of the city are people of color. When we link that reality, that, that, that current fact, to historical parallel experience, uh, in terms of similarly racially targeted and genocidally intended uh, federal policy, such as the, the continuous journey provisions that, that targeted uh, n potential new Canadians from South Asia, the Chinese Head Tax and Exclusion Act, which targeted the, the Chinese Canadian community, uh, the associated um, and aggressive proselytization that accompanied those policies and, and continues to do so in terms of current contemporary immigration policy. But with thinking about all of that, how can, or is there effort being made at building broader, under, deeper understanding within those various diverse constituencies and how we might go about doing so in, in building support for this, these sorts of campaigns. Okay, thank you. Answers? Quick. Quick. quick answer. I have a quick okay. answer. Mary? I, I'm not a board member of the Native Women's Association, but I've worked with NWAC for a long while, and one of the things that we are starting to do now is um, work in coalition more with um, members of uh, re or organizations in the visible minority community to tackle common issues in court. And certainly through the Sisters in Spirit campaign, NWAC has had a lot of um, support from uh, other late settler communities, I can put it that way. And so there is a lot of potential there, but um, I think that uh, one of the difficulties is that Coalition building takes time and resources, and they're um, always in um, scarcity in an organization that is representing people who are fighting for their lives. So, 
you know, it's just a question of ways and means, not a question about whether it's a good idea. Next question. Hi, my name is Diane Botcher, and I'm from Christian Island, I'm close to Life First Nations. Um, my question is, um, I've, I have, my mother was um, originally from Christian Island. She had passed away before Bill C-31 came out in 1985. My question is now, I, they classify me as a C-2, I think, I think six, that's six, correct, two, six, six, two. 6-2. And um, the problem that I'm having is that I'm meeting a lot of people um, that um, their parents um, married a non-native man and be because of the bill that had passed in 85, the mother of, um, has full status, in, in, full status. Her children, which are half, have full status as well. Therefore, that means the grandchildren, whether they're na full-blooded native, you know, whether the father is white or, or non-native, also get status. I, I, I've seen this happen through three people already, and I, this is that the question is: is how does this happen? It could be dates. It could be dates. dates. Yeah. When marriage just happened. Yeah. yeah, like if they were born before the mother lost her status, yeah. that that could be why. If the children, you know, uh, the the children are registered the same as the mother, who, uh, you know, uh, now, which is six one C. And even though they're half, they're still considered full. Yeah. And that's how that happened. That's See, how that the, happen. I mean, that's yeah. wrong. Yeah. It's totally wrong. Because, you know, like here I am, I'm, I'm fighting. I'm, I've, been, I've fought for my, you know, i fought for this all my life. You know, mm -hmm. just because my mom passed away before the bill came out, my children don't get status. It's, that's just like, it's wrong. What can I do to, what can I do to change this? That shouldn't make any difference. No, that should be no. It's, it's it's not right. It's yeah. not fair. No. Yeah, you can you can come see me too. We can talk. <laughs> <laughs> Alan's increasing her caseload tonight. <laughs> it's two hundred and two now. That's <laughs> yeah. right, Michael. Uh, my name is Michael Sheena, and I'm a Treaty Indian from uh, Moose Factory First Nation. Uh, one thing about Bill, C Bill C-31 is that it, it uh, increased the band membership of uh, First Nations communities in 1985. My question to you is, uh, can you tell me how many, uh, how many bands have control of their uh, band memberships? The, um, I, don't, I can't give you, Michael, um, specific numbers, but the number of communities that took the uh, opportunity to establish band membership codes, uh, they were given a two-year deadline from 1985. They had a two-year deadline that uh, Canada unilaterally imposed, and a few community, communities did rush to meet that deadline to put in codes. Uh, there's still a provision in the Indian Act that allows First Nations to establish membership codes, uh, and other communities have, after 1987 implemented that but the number of communities who have control is not significant I believe that the majority would still be under the Indian Act right now um, we have um, right now we are supposed to start with our uh, evening session but I wanted to give everyone a 10 minute uh, stand up move around maybe grab something quickly kind of break and we'll start at 620 with our evening panel and I want to you know invite all of you to stay. We have an art exhibit, a fine art exhibit that was presented by ANPAVA. Please take an opportunity to review that. We have the Law Society Treasurer, uh, the Chief Justice from the uh, Ontario Court of Appeal, and we have some Métis Fiddler uh, Quartet performing. So I encourage you and invite you to stay for that. No.